Thanks for the introduction and thanks for the invitation. Um, it's great to be here. I really enjoyed the first two uh, talks, three talks, and um, I, I look forward to hearing the discussion and everything else. Most of what we do in risk assessment is based on the concept that there's a, a exposure level below which humans do not have uh, a risk or much of a risk. So I was asked the question, what does the science say about the existence or non-existence of thresholds? Uh, I don't know how to turn up the volume on my, on my microphone. I'm sorry. Um, so I'm gonna go through several things. First of all, some definitions. Then I'm gonna talk about the concept of additivity to background, that's important. Then we're gonna look at what does theory, what the scientific theory says, what does the data tell us, and then what are some basic practical considerations. So let's start with some basic concepts. This is a dose set of dose response curves. You've got exposure across the bottom, probability of some sort of uh, adverse effect across the, the y-axis, and then these are different potencies. The purple line is the strongest response, and then you get less and less response as you go down. All of these are linear models, which means they start at zero, climb immediately, and go in a straight line throughout the entire range of dose. Now, before I start talking about other types, I want to make sure you're clear on one thing so you don't get misled when you're looking at data. A lot of times people like to present their data on a log scale. So the dose is in log of dose instead of the original dose. And when I take these straight lines and take the log of dose instead of the dose itself, you can see the lines curve and look like they have potentially a threshold. This is misleading because of the transformation. So everything I'm gonna give you is in original dose so you can better see what that looks like. There are four basic shapes of dose response curves that are used in evaluating health risks. Superlinear uh, is the top one, and a superlinear dose response curve is very interesting. Uh, the curve climbs very rapidly up from zero dose uh, and then sort of plateaus out and goes. This is common for things that are biochemical processes that have to start up very quickly. Linear dose response is exactly that. It's a straight line. The response is proportionate to the amount of dose across the entire curve. Sublinear, I'm sorry, sublinear starts with a slope of zero at dose zero. That means nothing's really happening very low doses. And then it slowly climbs until it starts climbing rapidly. And then it start, climbs very rapidly. And finally, there's the threshold dose response. And this one's unique in that it says there's a, this entire range where nothing happens. And then at some point, something begins to happen and you start to see effects occurring. Um, now, let's talk about what additive to additivity to background means. And I'll start with something that you can maybe get a better handle on. You're in a car and the car is sitting parked in your driveway. It's an automatic, so I'm not gonna worry about shifting gears and, and dropping the clutch. But you put a little bit, your foot down on the accelerator and the car doesn't move. And a little more and it still doesn't move. And then all of a sudden the transmission catches and the car moves forward. So that's starting from nothing and you have to go. On the other hand, if I'm driving down the road, say at 10 miles, 10 kilometers per hour, and I put my foot a little bit on the gas pedal, I will speed up immediately to maybe 11 kilometers per hour. There's no hesitation, it's moving. That's what additivity to background means. If I'm looking at something which is already running, a chemical process, and I drop a new chemical in there that adds to that process or changes that process, it's more like the car moving than the car sitting still. And that's important because when you look at that concept, and look at it in terms of human bodies and the biochemistry happening in our cells, then what you see is that instead of the slopes being all zero, low or infinity at the dose of zero, at the dose of zero of, in this case, a phytoestrogen, uh, an environmental estrogen, you see that they're already climbing and they're approximately linear down that low dose range. They have an increasing slope. 
but the threshold model does not. So it is unique in the sense that it doesn't, it doesn't handle this phenomenon at all. Okay, so consequences of additivity. Um, for non-threshold models, there's no area where nothing happens. Uh, if you've already got a process ongoing, like say estrogen receptor and toxicity associated with endogenous estrogen, like breast cancer and things like that, then even small doses of a chemical that enter into that process can increase the risk. There's no apparent threshold theoretically. Threshold models is a very strong assumption and can it be proven? So many people have spent a lot of time looking at that question. And I'm gonna show you a little bit of it in some of the work that we did. Uh, this is just a picture of how a natural ligand binds to a receptor in a cell. That receptor and ligand then typically, in some cases, will bind to DNA and that DNA will then start to produce transcript, which will give you eventually protein, and the protein does the work inside the cell. Now, if I come in with a xenobiotic ligand, a chemical that also binds to that receptor, I've got a competition going on. That receptor and that xenobiotic ligand can also bind to DNA and cause the protein to change. So in a system like this now, what does the shapes of the dose response curves look like? Well. They can look like any number of things. Um, here's one type of example where you see that depending upon how much natural ligand you have, you can see that the dose response curves look sort of linear in the low dose region, except in the case where there's no natural ligand. And that's that phenomenon I told you about before with the stopped car versus the moving car. If there's no ligand, you've got to get set system moving. And that bottom curve shows you what looks like a sort of a threshold area and then it starts to climb. If, if you look at chemical reactions for those, that picture I just gave you and you start looking at it, you can see all kinds of different dose response curves. And I'm not gonna walk you through each of these, but here you see a dose response curve where it rises and then it drops. Uh, so you can see low dose increases and then high dose, nothing happens. You can see things that rise and plateau. You can see the things that don't change and then drop off. They rise and then they drop below what happens without the ligand. Uh, you could see shifts in the distribution so that what normally would happen in a low uh, range for the environmental, for the, for the process happens at a higher range. Again, you can see things that go up and down so there's all types of possibilities of those response curves, theoretically, based upon uh, what's actually happening in these systems. <clears throat> if we look at cancer, this is a two-stage model of cancer. Um, here you have normal cells, they get mutated, become initiated cells, they get mutated again, can become malignant cells, and that leads to a tumor. All of the cells are going through replication, some of them die, there are two types of basic um, chemical concepts in this, what's called initiation and promotion. Initiators affect that first mutation rate or that second mutation rate, and promoters affect the birth or death rates of the initiated cells or the malignant cells. And you can ask yourself, what does the dose response curve look, look like for an initiator versus a promoter? And when you work through all the math and do several different things, again, you can see all types of different patterns. But what's surprising is that promoters tend to have very linear dose response and initiators theoretically tend to have a little bit curvature to them in the dose response. So from the theory, um, it's important that you know how to handle existing processes relative to xenobiotic. And that makes a big difference in what the dose response curve will look like. All types of shapes are possible depending upon the underlying process. And there's no clear pattern that emerges. <coughs> Excuse me. Let's look at some empirical data. So we took 350 rough, give or take, rodent cancer bioassays um, that were looked at by the National Cancer Institute and the National Toxicology Program. And from that, we generated 390 
dose response curves for those chemicals that actually cause the cancers. We fit a model that was very flexible to it. And that model can be linear, quadratic, which is sublinear, or square root, which is superlinear. And we look to see how often we get these patterns. And here you can see, looking at part B here, you can see that roughly 30, a third of them are square roots, so super linear. About 20% are linear, and the rest have this sublinear dose response shape. But what you can also see in part A right here is that uh, roughly two thirds of them fit a linear model, a square root model, and a quadratic model. So you don't get a lot of differentiation from the data to be able to do that. If you break it into chemicals that cause DNA damage and mutations by using AIMS test, now you're looking at chemicals that are initiators versus chemicals that are not necessarily initiators. And what you see down in part B here is there's no difference. There's absolutely no difference, whether it's an AIMS test positive or an AIMS test negative, the pattern of shapes of dose response curves is about the same. If you look in part A, that's true as well. You don't see very much. Um, we also looked at uh, DNA damage, other assays, and basically see the same pattern. Let's now look at um, a different endpoint. Here we're looking at cytochrome P451A1 uh, induction from exposure to TCDD. Uh, you're looking at the concentration of TCDD in the liver on the bodies or in uh, female rats, uh, and the induction in the y-axis. And what you see here in the, the big curve is a curve that has independent induction. That means there's no additivity to background. And additive which means there is additivity to background. And what you see is the two curves fit right across the top of each other through the entire range of the data. And when you get in the low dose region, you see a very slight difference in the shapes of the dose response curves. And we've done this for dozens of different chemicals and dozens of different inductions. And we generally see the same thing. You can't differentiate the shape of the dose response curve based upon the data that you're looking at. So generally, you have insufficient data to differentiate between the models. In general, the data can seldom tell you whether you have a threshold. This is an unsubstantiated assumption. It's not a scientific assumption. Practical considerations. When you look at engineering, there are thresholds. There's no doubt. You get failure of a structure, failure of a machine, failure of a system, and you can pinpoint exactly what happens. And in engineering, they engineer into that safety factors, duplication of processes, et cetera, to make the probability of failure drop much further down. But in chemi chemistry, um, thresholds are really only associated with state changes, liquid to gas, gas to solid, liquid to solid. Then you get thresholds occurring. But with continuous biochemical reactions in human cells, you're seldom going to see thresholds in that, those chemical reactions. If you were redesigning risk assessment right now, I would have to conclude that the most likely approach should be nonlinear models that are mechanism-based that do not have thresholds in them. And with that, I'll quit. Thank you very much. <laughs>